Hi all. Hi Natalia. Hi. Hi everyone. Yes, I'm Natalia exactly, but I'm, unfortunately I do not see you. Ah, I've uh, here you go. Um, da -da. <laughs> oh, now it's good. Yes. Are there any other participants? I've kept my I kept my camera off just because uh, I don't my internet hasn't been that. Okay, so how are you in these difficult times? Uh, oh yes, I, uh, I see you another one saying hi. So. <laughs> yes, uh, everything is okay. Uh, do you stay at home yeah, now, I'm, I'm, or you're uh, outside well, somewhere safe, at the right place? Um, I hope you're well too. Home. The same story. <laughs> uh, home. Uh, yeah, we're not allowed. Uh, we're not allowed to the workplace yet. So. Um, yeah we're hi julie yes hello julie. Yeah. can you hear me well yeah. hi everyone joining the call okay, great so i think we will start in about two minutes yes perfectly okay Okay, so um, it's already 12 in Moscow. It's time to start. My name is Yulia, and um, on behalf of uh, Cambridge Assessment English, on behalf of our partners, um, Cambridge Assessment Admissions Testing, OET, Cambridge University Press, and uh, Northwestern State Medical University, named after Ilya Mechnikov, um, I'm happy to welcome you to our online conference about teaching and assessing medical English. So if you can hear me well, please put a plus in the chat box. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Wonderful. So our conference um, is the first conference uh, about teaching and assessing medical English in this format. This is an online virtual conference. So uh, the platform we are using is webinar.ru. This is Russian local platform. And just a few words about this platform. So there are two sections, uh, the chat, um, and uh, there is a special uh, section for questions. So if you have some special questions to our presenters, please write your questions there. We will be happy to answer. Uh, I think it's time to start, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to introduce our first presenter, Aaron. Aaron is the representative of uh, Cambridge Assessment Admissions Testing. And um, um, Aaron, now I'm going to upload your presentation. Perfect. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Uh, one second. You can refresh the page if you have some problems. Still loading on my screen. Okay. Wonderful. No, it's it's, it's uh, I can see it perfectly now. Good. Good. Um, I, I, hi, everyone. Um, do let me know at any point if my connection isn't very good and I will turn off my uh, my video um, and that will help with the connection itself. Um, 
So hopefully I'm going to set some good context for this discussion, um, which is about teaching and assessing medical English. Um, and I'm specifically focusing on what I call kind of the most oversubscribed university course. Um, so as Yulia said, my name's Aaron Mortslock. Um, I'm one of the managers at Cambridge Assessment Admissions Testing. And um, so you know where Cambridge Assessment Admissions Testing sits. Um, so Cambridge Assessment is a department of the University of Cambridge. Um, they do a lot of different things um, from GCSEs and A-levels and international GCSEs and A-levels, but also um, very much at the heart of the English language. So really helping people learn English, teach English, and prove their skills to the world. And that's where Cambridge Assessment English really sits. Um, and Cambridge Assessment Admissions Testing, um, I'll shorten it at some point, um, is a, par a part of Cambridge Assessment English. And we're really focused on that medical admission part. So, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, where the current state is. In so I will talk about the current state and the trends, and then I will also talk about some of the challenges. And some of the challenges um, surround medical English, some surround the selection and the types of selection we use. So hopefully I'll give a good context for later discussions. So a bit of a current state and some facts. So medicine, when you look at courses globally, medicine is simply the most oversubscribed course. So we are we are talking about sometimes 10 to 1 in terms of applications. And so there's some real challenges with selecting and choosing the way you select um, for people on that course. And therefore, the people that are really going to thrive in that medical course. Um, in most cases, they're five to six years. Um, they can vary quite a lot around the world, you know, particularly in Europe. Um, they are uh, undergraduate, but places like the US and Canada, they are postgraduate. So you would do a degree before and then you do a second degree, which would be a medical degree. Um, so you can get people doing medical courses at different stages in their life. And where we're seeing some of the changes is that these English medium courses are becoming very prominent and they're part of that internationalization initiative of those universities. So going from teaching a course in the local language, which might be Russian or Spanish, and then going to teach um, an English medical course um, that's an equivalent to that local course. Um, it's quite a challenge, but it also opens up a, a world of opportunities. Um, and then a really interesting focus is um, looking at diversity. So being able to see the diversity of the applicant pool um, and making sure that the applicant pool and the people enrolled on the course then reflect the community at which they serve. And that's quite an interesting issue, but also a really interesting place for medical courses to be. So when we're looking at the selection process more generally, um, there's a lot of information collected. So when we look at what uh, a process would typically look like, we have lots of information like school leaving qualifications. But the really interesting part is now this even more heightened focus on language ability, particularly in a when you're delivering a course that's an EMI, English medium instruction course, um, and what type of language we're looking at, whether we're looking at that broader English and social English and general English, and then moving towards that kind of more advanced medical scientific English that um, students are now bringing, um, which br brings in another complexity to the process. And typically, you know, this, very oversubscribed course has to introduce a multi-stage process and that typically ends with an interview and um, universities place weightings, they rank the students um, and then um, they make offers to the students. I'm just going to ref ah, okay, refreshing. Um, in the UK particularly uh, we have predicted grades so that introduces another complexity to this process and so we're talking about the most oversubscribed course with potentially high numbers of applicants and having to select and now with this introduction of even more English language even more um, rigorous processes even more um, high achieving applicants we need a way to really distinguish between those applicants So what I thought might be quite interesting is to see what's changing, what's trending um, in this medical selection process. So how, how are we selecting 
these students who are really going to thrive in these courses and how are we introducing measures that allow us to select the people who are the best fit for those courses and going to become um, the best doctors, the best consultants, etc. So number one, um, we're moving from this traditional single one hour interview uh, with maybe a one person to one person Skype or one person to one person interview in person to these multiple mini interviews where um, short interviews are taken taken place. Um, they, they look at applicants to um, across a variety of different measures. So as you can see from one of the pictures in the UK, we might look at the National Health Service values and we can have a, for example, a 10 minute focused interview with the individual on the NHS values. And then we can move to something else, a specific task, for example, or a, a specific theme. So it really gives this introduction to have specific parts of the interview process with people that are the specialists in those areas and something that's very unique to each university. So this move to shorter, what we call MMIs, um, has really introduced a different way to interview. And it also allows us to bring in um, potentially students, uh, medical students who are currently on the course, and also even service users. So people um, that are being served by, by us as doctors and the community. A second part of this is um, situational judgment. So situational judgment being um, where a either a video or a, a live scenario happens where you're introducing an applicant to that process and one of the ways that we're looking um, we're seeing this is the terminology that's used in those scenarios we're getting implicit information about students understanding terminal medical terminology students understanding medical english students understanding the complexities of the dialogue between um, potentially a patient and their doctor um, and so although these are very high resource can be quite complex to set up it's a rich set of information that an applicant can give and also a university can see about particular applicants and how they um, either act or how they respond to those scenarios um, and the other place is really trying to bridge the gap between finding students that do really well at school, so the high achieving applicants that come into medical courses, and finding those that will really thrive in a medical course, because a medical course is very demanding. So although a student may have done very academically well at school, they may not be able to perform so well in that university course because it's that demanding. So where an admissions test comes in, it starts to bridge that gap between what skills and knowledge did you need um, and demonstrate at school and what skills and knowledge do you need to reflect and be able to demonstrate at their medical course. So we introduce this idea of the application of scientific knowledge and that's a really important part of that process to be able to see can a student go from um, that more rote learning environment that memory led environment to an environment where they're having to be in front of a patient potentially in a clinical environment and having to apply that biological or physics or mathematics or chemistry knowledge that they've learned and into into tweet into wine all of that and then also these non-cognitive aspects. So being able to introduce um, measures that assess, for example, can a student, um, can an individual communicate in an empathetic way? Because that's quite a different skill and not something we traditionally look for um, at a school level, but it's something when an individual get in, gets into a clinical environment, we're certainly gonna have to see that. If you think about someone like a paramedic, we certainly want to see um, resilience and empathy in the way they communicate with patients in quite a high stress environment. And finally, um, I'll only talk briefly about this um, because uh, my colleagues at OET and other colleagues are going to talk about this in a lot more depth and are certainly more specialists in this, in this area. Um, but this, we are certainly seeing um, a focus on this medical in English. So talking more broadly about um, wanting students to demonstrate their English language level for a course that may not be their native language, but then also moving towards um, the ability to talk in scientific or medical English, where that's producing in context English. So reflecting the environment they'll be working in, reflecting the environment they'll be studying in. And the ways we get that information might be through the assessments like OET, it might be through 
interviews like these MMIs, but also um, I've put up an example here of how we um, get students to write an individual single page essay um, that might talk about a scientific topic. And we're really getting them to argue both sides of that topic because um, medical courses uh, are great in that they introduce and reinforce this uncertainty of that not every scenario has um, an exact answer. And so by introducing this, we're getting students to reflect on arguments of both sides and that not all um, diagnoses, um, et cetera, have a singular answer. So we talked a little bit about the current state, um, current state being um, where medical selection is at um, and also where things are trending so that we can move towards ways of selecting you know, the, the students with the highest potential. But now hopefully that gets people to reflect on their selection process and who they're selecting to teach in their courses and who they're selecting to learn and nurture in their medical courses. But if we're starting to think about that, we might start to think about, well, how could we change our process and what is the ideal process? So what I want to introduce is some of these challenges in selection to say, you know, if we want to design this ideal process, how can we do that and what should we be thinking about? So what I want to talk about firstly is this, what we consider the, the key challenge. So the key challenge is really, we have a very oversubscribed course. So amongst very high performing individuals, how do we find the students who have the highest potential? The students who are really going to thrive on that demanding course and the students that are really going to thrive on our demanding medical course because it's it can be unique to each university. So we're looking for students with that highest potential. So to think about that and to address that challenge, we need to, we need to say, well, what makes a student thrive on their course? And what makes a student thrive on that course is um, what we consider these three separate different, separate um, skills and knowledge. So number one, we're looking for students who can take that scientific knowledge that they've learned um, at, for example, at the age of 16 at GCSE or IGC or at up to the age of 18. We want to see that they can apply that curriculum knowledge um, in that clinical environment. So that transition from rote learning and memory of biology or chemistry, physics or maths, and then taking that and applying that in that, in that real, real life environment. We also want to see individuals who have what we call cognitive skills, those relevant cognitive skills. So we might say something like critical thinking. So if, a, if an individual is in front of a patient and they're giving lots of information, um, lots of information, they may even prior to seeing um, their doctor, they may have searched on Google their diagnosis and come with, a, come with an answer. So critical thinking introduces um, the ability to look and say, and potentially identify flaws in that diagnosis or be able to question and ask the right questions that would give um, a conclusion or would allow you to get additional information that may change that conclusion. So these type of skills allow us to allow us to find the students who will really do well in that clinical environment. And then finally, relevant non-cognitive skills. So um, this is where later people will talk about things like communication skills, things like empathy. So these are the skills that um, really separate students from the academic environment to the one where they'll really thrive in that real life clinical environment. So when we've thought, okay, well, now we know this challenge, this big challenge about finding students with the highest potential, we know what we're looking for. So we know that we're looking for that skill and knowledge. We're looking for these cognitive skills, these non-cognitive skills. We need to then find a way to identify the students. And the way to identify them is to look at their selection process and say, what information do we need to collect? And what assessments do we need to use to collect that information? So we can say um, we need to incorporate, have assessments that incorporate these skills and knowledge. So assessments that look at critical thinking or assessments that look at that scientific knowledge. We then need to have assessments that say um, that demonstrate they predict future performance because 
the ones with the highest potential are the ones that are going to do well on that course. So we need information that demonstrates that it has predictive validity in the future. And then we also need to look at a more holistic evaluation of applicants. So not using one single piece of information that decides that a student gets into medical school, but actually looking more broadly to say, what is the threshold for each skill or um, what is the threshold for each set of knowledge that we would accept from students that would allow us to make a, an informed evaluation and see the whole student for their application. And that spans from their uh, curriculum knowledge to their um, personal statements, to their performance in interviews, to their ability to uh, talk more broadly, speak more broadly um, in both general English and medical English and beyond. So it's really finding what is important to that university and how can we incorporate a holistic evaluation of each applicant. So now we've um, probably thought about the process and we've designed in our heads or we'll think about this ideal process. You know, we want to collect lots of different information about lots of different skills. We want the applicants to have, you know, perfect, um, more social English, perfect medical English. Um, we want them to be talking in multiple languages. Um, also, we want to do all these things that will take up a lot of resources. But then we come to the point where we need to design something that's that's realistic, something that we can actually implement. So, and here I've tried to introduce some of the challenges that you'll come across in designing that process to select those applicants that will really thrive on the course. And hopefully I can provide some ways that we've uh, solved or at least try to solve um, these challenges and hopefully it'll give you some inspiration about how in designing your selection process how in designing your assessment processes and your teaching and how that all reinforces and how you can overcome some of those challenges so number one I talked about application of um, scientific knowledge so that's the curriculum that students will have learned and when we're talking about curriculum, we have to think about whose curriculum. In this environment where English medium uh, medical courses um, operate, we're going to have lots of different, um, lots of students coming from lots of different educational systems. So therefore, we need to decide on what is the relevant curriculum that they're going to be assessed against. And so what, one of the measures we took was we um, spoke to the universities we worked with um, and international exam boards to understand what is the curriculum, the scientific curriculum that's relevant for students um, to be able to really thrive. The, the, the curriculum that we want them to know before coming into medical school, school. And what we found was um, that those across biology, chemistry, physics and maths, we could define curriculum at the age of 16 that we would want them to learn and therefore be able to apply and that application of the skill was deemed almost as important as the curriculum they would have learned so in doing that we were able to draw up a curriculum that we could publish to students for free so that the important part being we could produce a curriculum guide that any student could access any teacher can access that would um, be the basis of their assessment. So there is uh, this kind of first level of having a test specification and then there's going beyond that and being able to familiarize students with the curriculum and be able to um, reintroduce them to curriculum they may not have learned for a year or two. So um, they may not have learned about the atomic structure for a little while. They may not have learned about levers for a little while. So we can reintroduce this curriculum to make sure that there's a level playing field for everyone that's going into that assessment. Um, and we did this and we worked with Moodle to be able to put that onto um, a platform where anyone can access. So anyone on this call can access as well. Secondly, um, I talked about having that equal playing field and we really want everyone to have the same access to information there shouldn't be any information in accessing medical school that a student could pay for over another student so we looked at um, how can we best support the students and we did that in two ways so 
that curriculum guide I mentioned before, but all of the preparation that we give for the students um, has become free. So videos, um, practice papers, etc. But then we also found that was differentiation in how teachers were supporting students. So we've designed and we've spoken to teachers and designed a teacher's toolkit that will allow them to help their students um, in preparing for assessments as part of their medical school application. But also it will have um, a washback effect in improving, potentially improving um, their recall of knowledge and their performance in their uh, age 17, 18 um, A-levels, which obviously is a difficult time right now. But um, we'll start to see that being able to refresh your knowledge of age 16 science across biology, chemistry, physics, and maths um, will support those students because typically students don't do all four of those sciences at um, age 17 and 18. So it gives them a, a good refresh. Um, accessibility is a, is always a, a sensitive one. And talking right now, um, physical access to the even just be able to apply um, to a university and a medical course is quite interesting. So um, a couple of the measures we introduced were fee refunds. So if a student um, wants to do an assessment, um, universities will support them in refunding the fee that they would pay potentially as an application fee or even as a, an entrance test fee um, to be able to apply. So it gives them a, access to a much wider pool of applicants who may otherwise not be able to apply. And then outside of the cost, we're talking about physical access. So the ability to, um, for example, fly somewhere to take an interview um, in person um, is, is a, can be a barrier to poten potentially EMI programs because um, you're going to get students from potentially all over the world who want to apply to your course. But having an in-person interview may, may be a hindrance to that. So I know for us that we, we have over 3,000 uh, centers where a student could take a test and we're building that every year to support that a student wouldn't have to travel more than two hours in order to take an assessment. And those kind of measures um, are quite interesting with current times. So I thought it would be useful to talk about where something is trending again in this physical access. So remote proctoring. So when we talk about remote proctoring, we're talking about online at home access to an assessment that would tip, typically be performed in a test center um, or potentially at a university. So you can imagine the difference between a student having to travel two hours or a student have to fly somewhere to take an assessment versus a student at home um, in their own environment being able to take a test under secure conditions. Um, and when we look at this, one example that I think really emphasizes this is even in-country assessments. So we work with Ashoka University in India um, and over two thirds of people live in rural areas, so non-metro areas, and therefore, a lot of them can't travel to even get to a test center um, that's spread all around the country. So they not only wanted to have applicants from in-country and give, a, um, give applicants, uh, all applicants a chance, no matter where they were based in that country, they also wanted to reach international applicants. So the introduction of remote proctoring, which I mean in the current environment is uh, somewhere where lots of places are moving to, um, meant that not only can you reach applicants in country, but you can start to reach applicants um, from all around the world in a very convenient way. Now language, um, I will talk less about the English side, but language is a very interesting one because um, when we have this introduction of uh, English medium courses, we start to question what language should we use in the assessment process? What language should, be, should we be using in the process to assess applicants to our course? So if we're teaching in English, should we be, um, should all of our assessments be in English? Or um, should our assessments be in English and also um, other languages? So for example, uh, we work with universities in Spain who run 50% English courses and 50% Spanish courses. Um, combined. So should we be introducing assessments and parts of the application process that cater to both um, students who may want to apply in English and students who may want to apply in Spanish? 
And so you can see that's uh, that's a debate potentially for a whole other webinar. But um, one of the things we did in Uzbekistan was we um, we spoke to at national level and to identify what what language would we want to use in the form of assessment and to keep it as open as possible. Um, Resource, considering resources, we translated into three different languages. So um, we translated into Uzbek um, and also a local language um, because they have multiple national languages called Karakalpak, which um, is from Karakalpakstan in Uzbekistan. And this introduced even more um, flexibility and even more access to assessments that were at school age. And finally, um, thinking about language translation, language translation can take a lot of resources. I'm, I'm sure for anyone on the call who's been involved in a course that's um, traditionally taught in their local language, so maybe it's taught in Russian, um, that tran then becomes taught in English. Um, we'll find that there's a lot of resource requirements to be able to get both the lecturers and the curriculum and also all the assessments translated so that those um, that course reflects the local curriculum course as well. So a course that was typically taught in Russian that's now taught in English, how do we reflect it so a student could apply to either, for example, and get the same experience? And that takes a lot of resources. Um, so one of the ways we try to help, um, we want universities to really focus and prioritize their resources is I mentioned you need assessments assessing skills and knowledge they value um, and you also that value also comes from having predictive value so you can see from this graph um, from a particular university in the UK when they're selecting amongst their applicants um, they are looking they are saying we've introduced another layer of assessment and this gray area here is where they didn't select any of the applicants. So you can imagine this is around 60 to 70% of applicants who um, applied, um, they haven't had to interview them. So you imagine all of that time they have saved by not interviewing the applicants because they can rely on um, the assessments they're using. So they can rely on the fact that they also have predictive value and they value the skills and knowledge that it's testing. And when I mean predictive value, I mean, um, looking at research like this. So on the right hand side, um, you'll see that um, there's a, a graph showing a score on the bottom. So this is a score in a particular assessment um, from zero to nine and the percentage of students getting that score and getting a first. So we're saying the higher the score I get, a student gets in a particular assessment, the higher the chance they're going to get a first, um, a high score in their first year of their medical course. So that's, that's saying the higher the score, the more likely a student will really do well in that first year. So that brings, brings back to that value of, can you have an assessment to select the students with the highest potential? And in reverse, when you look at scores and say, okay, well, what, what was the probability of a student getting a third, so a, a low score, or even dropping out of the course, and compared to their score in a particular assessment? So in this case, you can see that um, the lower the score, um, it's quite a small graph, but the, lo the higher the score, the lower the probability, almost 0% probability um, after seven that they were going to get a low score or drop off the course. Um, so you can see this in terms of how your own university would prioritize the resources. They would say, okay, we've now introduced an assessment that we know we value, um, we know has predictive value, um, so we can start to look at less applications, interview less people, and decide those that who are going to do very well, and also those who we know aren't going to do so well, those who are um, identifying amongst those higher potentials. So I'm going to finish there, which is uh, slightly quicker than uh, anticipated uh, but I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions um, and I've seen some questions come up from the side but um, there's some things that I, I think are really important to, to really conclude on and remind you of. So um, one, um, when we're looking at the selection process and also when we're looking at 
um, teaching assessment, we need to really remember what we're selecting for. So what are we trying to do in introducing that assessment? So whether that's assessing medical English, whether that's assessing um, students who are going to really thrive on our course, we need to think about what we're selecting for. So are we selecting for someone who would do really well on the course or are we selecting someone who's going to be a good doctor in 10, 15 years time? And we need to be realistic about what that is. We then need to think about what selection methods we're introducing. So we know about what we're looking for, but how we select and what information and assessment we use really can impact who we're assessing amongst. So if we're using an assessment that can only be accessed in a limited way, then we're going to restrict the applicant pool. Whereas if we're using an assessment that can be widely accessed, things like remote proctoring we're talking about right now, um, can really impact the applicant pool. Um, and then finally, we talked about transparency and fairness. So ensuring that um, students and applicants are very much aware of how we're selecting, what we're using, um, and, and how we can maintain fairness in that process to really ensure that everyone has an equal chance to show um, the high potential that they have to succeed on a medical course. Um, and on that note, I'll say thank you everyone for listening. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions that anyone has either in the chat box um, or now um, and I'll be on the call for the next uh, until the end so I can answer any questions that come up as well. Uh, I can see a question from Jacqueline. Um, also, um, so Jacqueline, the Spanish universities I mentioned. Um, so we have uh, CEU Cardinal Herrera University, um, which is uh, in Valencia. Um, and we also have the University of Navarra who teach in English and Spanish. Uh, Katharina. Um, you asked about multiple mini interviews. Um, so how many do we hold? Um, I'm not part of a university, um, but what I've typically seen is that um, universities will have around five to 10 minutes for each part of their interviews. So hence multiple mini, um, and there would typically be around five of those. So five interviews of about 10 minutes with maybe a couple of minutes break in between to uh, transition between them. Any more questions? If not, I'll pass on to my colleagues um, much, earlier, much earlier than I anticipated. Aaron, can I ask a question orally? Not yes, I think. So Aaron, uh, the information you have been delivering is really amazing and really useful. And now we can judge how far we are from everything that is being Done currently in the world, mm. but uh, the only one fact wasn't mentioned in your presentation. And could you clarify a little bit about the tools, methods, and uh, probably ways that you have already been considered to um, fulfill our needs in a new situation of teaching and learning when we all have gone distant? Yes. Um... Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, for us, uh, the the real impact that we've seen and the thing we're getting asked most about is that remote proctoring. So, working with being able to transition from an assessment that's typically delivered in a, on a piece of paper um, in a test centre, um, potentially anywhere around the world, to a place where you can maintain that level of security um, while hosting a remote assessment. So, um, what we've been doing is um, working with universities to transfer our assessments that we currently deliver in in paper to remote proctoring and whilst maintaining um the way and the security we 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 have for delivering them so we've been working with a company called metal um so metal are a, a part of the mercer group um, and they deliver or they have a platform to for delivering um remote proctoring and to do that um, we've 
uh, they manage all the platform, they manage all the delivery, and they work closely. Um, and the universities we work with are very happy about how they're um, the partnership and the, the close collaboration they're having with Metal uh, via us. Um, and that's transitioning the materials that um, and the content and the questions that we have. Um, I think for us, we're quite, I would say, lucky in that um, our, particularly the skills section and the scientific application of scientific knowledge sections of our assessments, um, they're multiple choice. So um, being able to transfer to multiple choice questions um, from paper to multiple choice questions that could be marked um, remotely um, and automatically um, is a potentially an easier transition than something that is fully written that needs lots of workings out um, and needs students to submit those workings. Um, so, I mean, that's certainly a challenge that we've, we're coming across, but um, having multiple choice questions as part of that assessment has, I think, been a, a barrier that we've uh, saved ourselves inadvertently. Hopefully that partly or at least or wholly answers your question. Yes, Aaron, thank you very much. Just uh, I didn't switch on the microphone. <laughs> thank you, I've got the idea. <laughs> That's okay. Well, um, yeah, thank you everyone for listening. Um, I'll pass on to the next speaker and I'll turn off uh, my microphone for now, unless there's anything else I need to do, Yulia. Hello everybody, I hope you can hear me. Um, so my name is Rebecca um, and I work for OET based here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, so my presentation today is going to be about OET, the Occupational English Test, um, or as we like to call it, the English Test for Healthcare Professionals. So um, to tell you a little bit more about um, what I'm going to cover in the next 45 minutes. I'm going to start off by explaining how OET is different to other kinds of English language tests that you may be more familiar with. Um, the main part of my uh, presentation is going to be on what is in the test. So my understanding is many of you are um, language teachers or teachers and so this is going to be um, perhaps the interesting part for you. Um, then I, I will also talk briefly about how OET is scored and how candidates can prepare for the test. Then I'll finish off um, with how your organization might make use of OET. And hopefully if I've got a little bit of time at the end, I'll share a few testimonials. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to join you um, on this online session, the first um, online medical conference um, from Russia. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. So let's get started. Um, how OET is different to other English tests? Um, I, I dropped off. I think I clicked the wrong button. Um, so sorry, I'm back. Uh, I'm back now. Um, 
So, as I was saying, um, how OET is different to um, other English tests that you may be familiar with. So, the materials that we use for the test have been designed specifically to replicate the kinds of um, language that uh, healthcare professionals are going to use um, in their workplace and obviously to make sure they're delivering healthcare that is of the highest quality and will ensure patient safety which are really important to both uh, regulators and um, employers. And we also work with subject matter experts, so medical experts to make sure that the test materials that we use um, are uh, medically accurate and are the sort of scenarios that healthcare professionals would be very familiar with. And finally, by preparing for OET, uh, candidates are going to learn the language that they need um, for the workplace. And so it, it becomes a very motivating experience for them. Now, while we talk about OET as a test, there are actually 12 versions of the test um, for 12 different healthcare professions. Our most popular versions of the test are uh, for medicine and nursing. But we also get a lot of candidates um, sitting the physiotherapy, the pharmacy and radiography versions, as well as these other five more minor professions. And when I say there are different versions, all the professions take the same listening and reading test. Um, but uh, the writing and speaking is specific to their professional. And I'll come on to show you some examples of that shortly. So the main way um, to, to explain how OET is different to other kinds of general or academic um, English tests is through the writing and speaking parts of the test, which as I've just mentioned, are specific to the particular profession that the candidate is sitting. So as you would be familiar with, um, in many of these other general and academic language tests, the writing task would usually be to write an essay on a general topic but the topics can be a very broad range. And similarly for speaking, um, for the candidate to respond to interview questions, but again on a very broad range of general topics. Whereas for OET, the writing task is profession specific um, and requires them to write a letter communicating some healthcare information generally to another profession, professional, sorry, a colleague perhaps or a specialist if they're requesting uh, more specialized care for their patient. And the speaking test uh, requires them to conduct a role play um, as their professional and um, with somebody who is taking the role of their patient and to role play the typical kinds of interactions that healthcare professionals will do on a daily basis. And I think nobody really needs to ask this question right now, obviously with the global uh, coronavirus situation, but um, obviously when the coronavirus situation has passed, um, probably even more so than there was prior to that, uh, many English-speaking countries are suffering from crippling healthcare shortages. So I think uh, recent figures from the UK at the beginning of this year was that they are short of 40,000 nurses. And that's only going to have risen, no doubt, as a result of, um, of the coronavirus. But even in other countries where um, it's not English speaking as their first language, everyone around the world is experiencing aging populations, uh, which is putting pressure on their healthcare systems. More nurses and care workers are needed uh, to be able to look after our aging population. And on top of this, um, there is growing awareness for patient-centered care. Um, so this is uh, becoming the norm in many healthcare backgrounds, um, involving the patient as part of the negotiation of treatment, um, involving the patient in deciding which treatment options are going to be uh, considered and so forth. And this re raises the need for higher levels of communication. Um, and finally, um, the, the costs involved with communication errors. Our partners um, at JCI based in America have done research on uh, the number of litigants who are suing the healthcare system there and, and the reasons for that. And, and uh, one of the very high reasons um, is communication breakdown between the professional and the patient or between um, professional colleagues. 
So if we move on now to explore in a bit more detail what is in the test, I'm going to go through each of the four sections in turn and I'll show you an example question and give you a chance to have a go at the question um, to some extent um, and get a feel for what the test is like. So starting off um, with listening, um, there are three parts to the listening test and it does take approximately 40 minutes to complete. Um, so part A um, consists of two short consultations between a healthcare professional and a patient. And the candidate is presented with a series of notes, which you can see in small version on your screen, of notes that the professional has made as part of the consultation they are listening to that consultation and the candidate needs to fill in the gaps in the notes that the professional has made. So with specific details perhaps about the patient's um, medical background, their social history, um, the treatment options that are being discussed and so forth. And the healthcare professional um, will generally be, uh, or the scenario behind the consultation will be that the healthcare professional speaking has had uh, the patient referred to them, perhaps for a second opinion or for some other kind of um, uh, care. So perhaps it could be a physiotherapist having a consultation with the patient. It could be a dietitian having a consultation with the patient. Um, and usually it's the first visit between the professional and the patient, which allows for that uh, background information to be gathered quite authentically. For part B, candidates are listening to six short dialogues or monologues, and these are all taking place in the workplace setting. So these kinds of conversations would be very familiar to healthcare professionals, perhaps in a handover setting, so professionals handing over a patient at the end of the shift, or perhaps uh, part of a briefing from management to a group of healthcare professionals. Typical kinds of uh, conversations that they would be very familiar with and for each of those uh, conversations there's one multiple choice question for them to answer. And finally part C um, is two longer presentations or interviews with healthcare professionals on a general healthcare topic, so something that would be of interest to all the healthcare professionals. Um, and sort of typical to the kinds of uh, professional development that healthcare professionals are expected to do as part of um, their annual professional development um, requirements. All right, so um, we're going to have a look at a Part B um, sample question. And um, to give you a little bit of information about a Part B question in listening, um, there, as I've mentioned, they're multiple choice questions. And before the audio plays, candidates have 30 seconds to read the question. They also have a context statement um, to read about the question and the audio they're about to hear, which can activate schemata in a helpful way to bring to the fore any vocabulary they know about this topic, about this conversation. And also this time allows them to notice the differences between the three answer options that they're choosing from. And this is going to be a helpful point for them while they're listening because all the answer options will be covered in some way in the audio. And so by focusing on the uh, differences that they have identified, um, it helps them to pick out uh, the key information as they listen. And the final point which is helpful for candidates is that when there are two speakers, uh, different genders are used so that candidates do not need to be confused um, about who is talking um, while they listen. So let's have a look um, at a question. Now, unfortunately, I was hoping to play the audio for you, uh, but unfortunately, we're not able to get the audio to work with the software. But um, I'll just give you uh, a minute to have a look at the question on the screen. So as you can see, this is quite a typical scenario. Um, we've got uh, a trainee doctor talking to his supervisor about a problem that he had had with a procedure. And if we look at the next slide, 
Um, one point to, to, to raise here um, that we advise to candidates is with this kind of question, which is a sentence completion question, it can be helpful for the candidate to turn this into a direct question. So it's something that they're more familiar with. So for example, what does the trainee feel caused the problem? Or what does the trainee think was the reason for the problem? And then, as I mentioned, to notice the three differences between the options available. So is it to do with treatment? Is it to do with the, the negative reaction of the patient? Or is it to do with the uh, equipment? So three quite different things that they can focus on while they're listening. And although you weren't able to hear, I can share that the correct answer was option A, because what you would have heard the trainee saying was, um, I had difficulty finding a vein. I suspect her illness means she'll have had a number of cannulas inserted over the week she's been here, and that's led to collapsed veins. Healthcare professionals would obviously be very familiar with the term cannula and would recognize it as a type of treatment which should help them to identify that A is the correct answer. But if we have a look at what the trainee said about the other options, the trainee mentions that the patient endured it without a murmur, which we can understand means they didn't have a negative reaction um, to trying to find uh, the vein. Um, and lastly, option C, the only equipment mentioned in the audio were the cannulas, as we've already pointed out, but there was no mention of them being used inappropriately. So this means option C cannot be considered correct. So we move on now to have a look at reading. Um, so reading also has three parts and um, lasts for 60 minutes. Um, however, part A is completed separately to the other two parts within a 15 minute time limit. And the reason for this is to allow, based on the feedback and the understanding that we have from regulators and employers, it allows us to test candidates under a bit of time pressure. Because um, what regulators say uh, healthcare professionals need to be able to demonstrate is on occasion that they can quickly source written information um, to be able to take appropriate action. And so part A is completed under a separate 15 minutes um, to allow for that time pressure to, to exist. And during those 15 minutes, candidates have uh, four short texts to look at and they need to use skimming and scanning skills to find specific details from those texts to answer um, questions. And we'll have a look at a part A question in a moment. Part B of reading is quite similar to the listening test in that it is workplace kinds of texts. So this time they have, um, as you can see on the screen here, a short workplace extract. And again, it's the type of typical communication that healthcare professionals might see perhaps on their staff from notice board or might be an email or memo that a manager has sent with an update of policy or procedure or so forth. And for each question, there is one multiple choice uh, question with answers to choose from. And finally, part C um, consists of two longer texts. Again, uh, on a general healthcare topic, um, which would be of interest uh, to candidates as part of professional development. Um, so the kinds of articles they might be reading could be recent research results or maybe journal articles. It's asking them to understand the opinions put forward by the writers to analyze and, and infer meaning that is presented to them from the text. So thinking about the, the reading part A, as I've just mentioned, so there's a 15 minute time limit and the candidates have four texts to look at with a total of 20 questions to answer. But to help them engage with the, the texts, the theme of the four texts, the texts are all on one theme and this is provided again to activate their schemata on what they are familiar with to do with that topic. Um, things like the layout and organization of the text will also aid in them being able to retrieve the information they need. 
And all of the answers um, are provided for them in the texts. So they can lift them directly from the text to answer each question. And each question, oh sorry, each answer is quite short. So either a single word or a short phrase, which they take directly from the text. The only thing that they need to consider with that is because they are copying directly from the text, they are expected to have perfect spelling. Um, and so it's important that they take a few extra seconds for each answer to check that they haven't made any spelling mistakes and are wasting any marks that they otherwise might have got correct. So here is an example, um, part A text. Um, the the um, theme here, as you can see, is fractures, dislocations, and sprains. And from a quick look of the text, we can see that it is a numbered list of instructions about the technique for applying a plaster back slab for arm fractures. That's quite difficult to say, actually, plaster back slab. Um, so having a look on the next slide, here I've shown you an example of two questions out of the 20 that would exist for the four texts. And obviously, I've only provided you with one text to have a look at. Um, but I'll give you a minute again now just to have a look quickly through that text to see if you can find the answers to those two questions. All right, so before I reveal the answer, um, I'm just going to show you um, a couple more things to do with this text. So as I mentioned, um, things like the titles and the subheadings or the numbered or bulleted lists or even numbers within the text, and you can see in this particular text there's quite a few numbers, all provide useful organizational tools to help the candidate locate the information that they're looking for. Um, but with the two questions that you were looking at, there's actually quite a lot of information from the questions that candidates can use um, in advance to predict the type of word and the category of word that they're looking for before searching the texts. So you could see that I've highlighted a couple of words out of the, the two questions, which lead me the ability to predict that for question four, I'm looking for a plural noun and that it's going to be a type of body part, <coughs> excuse me, which comes from the clues from parts of a limb. And in question, in the second question, uh, again, I think I'm going to be looking for a noun, and this type, time, a type of material, which I get from the words used to cover. So if we have a look now at the answers, We can see that in both cases, some of the words that I'd highlighted come up in the text around the same location as the answer. And we can see that the answer for question one, or the first question, sorry, is bony prominences. And the second answer is crepe bandage. Um, but just as a reminder here that uh, candidates should check the answers that they have um, chosen from the text match the predictions um, that they made before they started looking for the information. Um, because, for example, they might go and think they found the answer, but then they compare it with what they thought the answer was going to be and think, well, I was looking for a plural noun, but the answer I think is correct is a verb. So perhaps um, I haven't found the right information from the text. And secondly, it may be that there are words that are unfamiliar to the candidates provided as an answer. For example, prominences may not be something that they're particularly familiar with. So it is very important that they do copy exactly from the text, as I mentioned. All right, so let's move on to writing, which, as I mentioned earlier, is profession specific. Um, and we're going to look at a nursing example. So here, candidates are provided with a set of case notes about a situation, about a patient who uh, would have a, a condition or a series of case notes that would be quite familiar to them as a nurse. Um, they are going to have to write a letter in response uh, to these case notes, um, and they have five minutes to read the case notes 
uh, during which time they can't make any notes or underline, for example, on the case notes. That's simply reading time to make sure they fully understand the task before they have 40 minutes to plan and write their letter. So there are several things that we encourage candidates to think about uh, during the reading time that they're provided. And here I've listed them on the screen. So the most important thing to consider is who am I writing to and why am I writing to them? And as part of that, is there any pre-existing relationship between the reader and the patient? And thirdly, which information does the reader need to continue caring for the patient? Those three things together form the really important information that candidates need to be able to select as soon as they start looking at the case notes because that's going to make um, lots of the decisions easier that they need to make when starting to write the letter. For example, how they're going to structure the letter to make it as clear as possible to the, uh, the reader by grouping information together. And secondly, um, which information they can omit because it's irrelevant to the current situation or reason for writing. So some information provided in the case notes, and we're going to look at an example on the next couple of slides, will be there um, as would be normal in any kind of um, case notes, but isn't going to be relevant to the particular reason that you're writing to this reader. And candidates, part of the test, need to be able to select the correct information to include uh, for the reader and omit the information that they don't need to know. So apologies that this will come up looking quite small on your screen, but after the session, um, you're very welcome, obviously, to visit the OET website, which is um, listed on all of the slides. Um, these sample tests are freely available um, to download for you to look at in greater detail, to practice uh, if you feel like it, to see what the test is like in, in, uh, for yourself. Um, but I'm just going to pick out a few things uh, from these notes uh, to explain um, how the candidate might use them. So the main thing, as I've mentioned in the previous slide, when you're in the reading time, the candidate should do is to focus on the task information at the end of the case notes, um, because this will identify for the candidate who they're writing to and what their reason for writing that to them is, um, as well as to help them start to make those decisions about which information they need to include and which information they should omit. So here on this next slide, and again, apologies, it's probably too small for you to read. On the left-hand side, there's two um, highlighted boxes of information, which are both irrelevant because in this task, um, the candidate is being asked to write a letter to the re retirement home where the patient normally lives, um, but has recently been hospitalized for some treatment. So the hospital is now discharging the patient back to the retirement home and uh, updating the home on the patient's current condition. This means that the next of kin information and the past medical history, which I've highlighted um, on these case notes, would already be known by the reader and so don't need to be included in the letter. But if we look on the next slide, these details that I've now highlighted are most important to the reader because they tell the reader what ongoing care is needed once the um, uh, patient returns back to the retirement home. So things like the progress the patient has made while in hospital and the nursing management that's going to be required for them post-discharge as part of their discharge plan. So candidates would use that reading time to go through the case notes, making a, no, uh, making a note in their mind of what information they need to include and what information they can omit because it's not relevant to the reader. With all of our sample tests uh, for writing, we also provide a sample letter. Um, and these are really useful uh, for candidates and for teachers to understand um, the way to structure a letter, the way to cover all of the information that is needed succinctly and professionally. And this example that we can see here starts with a clear reason for writing so the reader would immediately be informed as to why they were receiving the letter. 
and then progresses through the situation when the patient left the reader's care, his progress since then, and his future needs to, to make a very clear timeline and a well-organized letter. And so the final part of the test is the speaking test. Um, again, this is profession specific and the candidate in the speaking test will take the role of their healthcare profession. So this means if they are a dentist, they will take the role of a dentist. If they are a doctor, they will take the role of the doctor. And then somebody else in the room, which is called the interlocutor, will take the part of a patient or perhaps the relative of the patient. And the interlocutor is not um, assessing or examining the candidate in the room. They are simply there to take the role of the patient or the relative to create an authentic sounding role play scenario for the candidate to uh, complete. The, um, there is an audio recording of the, the role play, the two role plays that are uh, conducted during the 20 minute speaking time. And these recordings are returned to Australia where all the papers are assessed. And the speaking test, as with all the, the tests, are then marked by two different assessors. So in terms of what is required in the speaking test, as I mentioned earlier when looking at the differences between um, OET and other kinds of language tests, which you may be more familiar with, one of the key differences in the speaking test is the power relationship between the interlocutor and the candidate. Because in OET, as they would in real life, the candidate is expected to manage and control the conversation with the patient. Um, they are expected to move the conversation on, they are expected to respond um, to the patient's concerns, provide information, but also to, to cover the information that they want to cover um, during the time that they have available with the patient. As part of this, they will need to demonstrate that they can reassure somebody who is anxious, perhaps deal with sensitive topics by politely and sensitively asking the patient for more information and also to juggle um, the language that they use between the, the specialist register that they're familiar with and the lay language that the patient will understand when discussing their healthcare needs and treatment options. So before the role play starts, candidates have three minutes to prepare. And again, like with writing, there are a number of questions that they can use to, to think about. Um, so who am I speaking to and why? How are they likely to be feeling? And how am I going to manage my time with the tasks? So these things uh, they can consider during this preparation time and they can make notes, they can underline, they can write down phrases that they think will be helpful to use during the conversation. They can also ask the interlocutor to define or pronounce any words that are unknown or unfamiliar to them so that they feel more confident uh, once the role play time starts. So on the roll cards, there are three sections of information which I'm just going to briefly explain now. So at the top of the roll card, um, there is a setting um, and this provides uh, clarity about whether the situation is routine or urgent and also to prompt the nurse in this case to consider what would be the appropriate way to start the conversation because obviously you would start a situation in an emergency setting in a different way to that you would start a home visit with the patient if you were in their home or if you were having a routine uh, checkup with the patient in your clinic. The second section of information is what we call the background information and this provides the candidate with contextual uh, detail to the conversation including the patient's health condition and the purpose of the conversation so what uh, they are going to be discussing during the role play scenario. And the third section of information on the role card are the tasks which act as prompts to help the candidate continue the role play for the five minutes that they have as well as to manage the conversation as I discussed um, a couple of slides ago to help them keep the conversation moving forward once um, an idea has been exhausted or completed satisfactorily to the patient 
um, they can then move the conversation forward uh, to address some of the other points. A couple of other things to pick out on the card. So often adjectives are provided um, to help the candidate understand how the person they're talking to is feeling. And again, to help act as a prompt about the tone they will take at the start of the role play. So in this example, we can see that the nurse is talking to the parent of a three-year-old child and the parent is anxious and becomes agitated. And this should alert the candidate um, to think about the type of language that would be useful both to start this conversation, but also how to reassure this patient, um, uh, sorry, this parent who is feeling anxious about their child's health. The task verbs that uh, are shown down the left-hand side of the task as well also help clarify to the candidate what is expected from the conversation. And they are expected to balance both giving and gathering of information to and from the parent in this case. Um, they are partly assessed on how well they listen and then respond to the parent's needs in this situation as well as how they provide and explain information. So it is a balance and that is an important one for them to understand because that is quite different to other kinds of healthcare tests. And finally, this card might look the same, but this is actually the interlocutor's card. We can see the word carer on the left-hand side. The interlocutor card mirrors the background information and the setting that is provided on the candidate card, but also provides some extra information to allow for unexpected turns. So as in real life, when patients will sometimes say things uh, that we're not expecting, um, it allows for that sort of natural, authentic interaction where the patient says something and the professional has to think on their feet as to how they would respond it to it. Sorry. So um, there are, in the interlocutor card, some extra bits of information, um, perhaps also some um, uh, indication of how they should behave, how they should respond to what the healthcare professional is telling them. So that was um, a, a snapshot of uh, the different parts of the OET test. And as I mentioned, you're very welcome to visit the website after the session to download a full sample test to get an idea of, of more detail of what the test is like. Just a little bit of detail on these slides about how, how OET is scored. So candidates receive uh, both a letter grade and a numerical score as part of their results. Um, the letter grade is what is required um, by regulators and employers. So generally, regulators are looking for a B grade um, in OET for registration purposes. But the numerical score is also provided to give candidates a visual idea of where within that letter grade their results sat. So, for example, if they didn't quite uh, get the letter grade that they wanted, their numerical score will show them how far away or how close they were to actually achieving um, that grade. And that will indicate to them how much preparation they might need uh, before considering a resit. Unlike IELTS, there isn't an overall grade for OET, um, but uh, the two sets of scores have been benchmarked. So you can see on the right hand side the IELTS scores and on the left side um, the, the, the letter grade and the numerical score um, for uh, OET. And these match. So the regulators are often requiring an OETB or an IELTS 7. And so we can see the connection there. Candidates receive a statement of results through an online portal. So they have an online secure site that they register, apply for the test and receive their results. And regulating authorities can access our verification site. Um, the candidate will then provide the regulator with access to their results um, and the regulator can check with OET that the result the candidate has shared is a valid one. And Thinking about security, because OET is a high stakes test, we obviously take security very seriously. And this includes things like malpractice checks uh, are carried out throughout the test process. 
um, at the time of registration for the test, but also uh, when they register on test day, OET is making use of world-class identification technology to make sure that the candidate who registered for the test is the one who's turned up to take the test on test day. All papers are double marked by trained assessors and as I mentioned in the speaking section, um, all the assessment is done um, here in Melbourne in Australia which allows for greater standardization and training for all of our assessors. And finally, as I've just mentioned, the secure online portal for results verification keeps those results um, secure for regulators. So for candidates who are preparing for the OET, um, this is a large part of my role at the organization as part of the education team. Uh, my role is to support candidates getting ready for the test, as well as to support teachers who are preparing candidates for the test. So a lot of the materials um, that I'm about to mention, um, I've worked quite intimately with and, and I'm very happy to share more details of after the session. So on the OET website is our preparation portal, which is a one-stop shop for test preparation for candidates. It includes a wide range of materials, many of which are freely available, and also we offer materials in a multiple study formats. So just some of the materials that we offer. Um, we offer a variety for different study types, different approaches to study, um, different budgets and so forth, ranging from sample tests and practice books down to the more interactive, fun quizzes, vocabulary building exercises and everything in between. And as I mentioned, across multiple study formats, so um, as well as the print version of books and um, print version of testing materials, we also make use of YouTube videos. We, um, or I offer online live Q&A sessions via Facebook twice a month for candidates to ask questions and receive advice. We have on-demand masterclasses about each part of the test as well as an online self-study um, course that candidates can purchase. So starting to think about how you might be involved, how you might be interested in making use of OET at your organization. OET is accepted um, by a large number of um, healthcare regulators, immigration boards, educational institutions, predominantly in Australia and New Zealand, as well as the UK and Ireland, but also these other countries which you can see on the screen. And our main partners for registration purposes in the UK, we have the General Medical Council and the Nursing and Midwifery Council, as well as their counterparts in Ireland, Australia and New Zealand. As well as um, registration purposes, OET is also accepted for immigration to Australia and New Zealand and for tier two visas now into the UK. We have test venues in a number of locations around the world um, and this number is growing. We've obviously had to put on hold right now our number of test venues and testing in general. Um, but once uh, the coronavirus situation has passed, we will be again increasing the number of test venues that we offer uh, to make sure candidates are never too far away from the test. So there are really three pathways that you can choose from um, to uh, get involved with OET at your organization. So the first option is to um, recognize OET as a sign of English proficiency. This could be through your admissions process um, to use OET as a way of uh, checking language for um, admission to a course or for exit testing, um, as well as for recruitment processes or all the way up to um, regulatory and governmental re uh, recognition for things like um, visas and registration purposes. The middle pathway is the one that I'm most familiar with. Um, this is um, becoming a language center to offer an OET preparation course or to embed OET skills into a healthcare course at your university. And finally, the third pathway is to become a test venue for OET and deliver OET on test day to our candidates. 
So for teachers and schools that are interested in offering an OET preparation course, we have uh, the Preparation Provider Program, or PPP as we call it for short. And this is an online course uh, which schools and teachers can study and comes in two sections. The preliminary section is available free of charge, is quite a short course and provides uh, teachers with the knowledge that they need to be able to run a very um, introductory OET kind of course to, to candidates. For some preliminary providers, there's also the opportunity to continue to achieve full premium status, and that includes some associated benefits, one of which is the use of the logo, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, the premium provider logo. For universities, as I mentioned, there's the opportunity to embed OET as part of a healthcare course. Uh, the skills that are being taught as part of an OET program, uh, as I've mentioned and I hope have demonstrated, are all very common skills that uh, healthcare providers will need to be using in patient-centered scenarios. And OET is a really good fit um, for delivering some of that content uh, to your students as part of their university course. Um, prior to clinical placement, for example, it's a really good um, package to use, um, uh, developing OET speaking skills to help them prepare to speak to real life patients and to understand how to cope with uh, the different emotional responses that patients sometimes provide. And becoming a test venue is something I'm less familiar with um, in terms of answering any questions um, if uh, you, you have questions on this at the end. But um, becoming a test venue is something that you can apply for through an application form on our website. Um, this would then be responded to by a member of our test venue team to discuss the suitability um, and the practicality of opening a test venue in your location. But certainly the other areas of offering an OET course um, and embedding OET into your university courses is something that I can provide you with more details and I can put you in touch uh, with the contact regarding test venues if that's something that interests you. <coughs> All right, I think I just have time to finish off with a few testimonials and then answer a few questions um, before my, my session comes to an end. Uh, so I just wanted to share with you a couple of um, testimonial comments from some of our candidates. So firstly on the right, a doctor from Iran who is m recommending OET because he felt that the format is related to the skills that, that doctors need to cope within our profession. Um, and on the left, the nurse from the Philippines talks about OET helping her pursue her goal for a, a new career, but also to boost her confidence in being able to, to speak to patients and provide quality care. And uh, this quote from Muolo, who is one of our um, video testimonial success stories on our website, who, who has a lovely way of explaining how OET has given her the confidence that I will be acceptable, that when she arrives in her workplace, um, she's going to be someone that patients and colleagues will accept. She has the ability to communicate communicate and that she has the confidence that she will eventually fit in in her new scenario which is so important and it means so much to us uh, preparing candidates to know that we are preparing them for this really important work and a very rewarding career in healthcare. And finally, a couple of testimonials from um, healthcare professionals. So firstly, Professor Martin Partridge, who's based in Imperial College London, who mentioned um, that the test materials are of extremely high standard, authentic and valid, as well as being highly relevant to day-to-day -day practice. And Dr. Alistair Flowerdew, um, who's a former medical director of three NHS trusts, who mentioned that it is both a comprehensive and testing exam and that he would feel confident to accept um, an OET result as an employer of overseas doctors. So that brings me to the end of my presentation, um, but I can answer some questions um, if you have any through chat. I'm also going to look at the question box um, as well. Um, so I can see a few questions. 
Um, Jacqueline has mentioned are there plans to add the equivalent CEFR grade on the results score chart? Um, Jacqueline, yes, we already have a version of the chart on our website which has the CEFR uh, mapping done. We had um, that uh, announced uh, late last year, so that is certainly something that you can now find on the OET website. And Hakan mentions, um, in the medical area, are there any sub-branches such as paediatrics or general sur uh, surgery, um, or is it covering just general medicine? So yes, um, it's covering the general range of all professionals within that uh, specialist area. So um, in nursing, it's covering nursing from midwifery um, through to palliative care and geriatric care and the same way for medicine and dentistry and so forth. So it's general medical topics that are covered uh, without any of those specialisms to, to make it as accessible as possible to most candidates. Um, okay, so those are the questions. I'm just going to have a look as well in the chat box. Um, so Sybil is asking whether it's possible to conduct closed sessions and can we only conduct the tests in previously agreed test venues? So Sybil, I imagine this is something to do with um, obviously the tests not being able to operate right now due to the coronavirus situation. Um, like the, the presenter before me who I heard mention remote proctoring, that is something that OET is actively looking into at the moment um, as a possible option that we might be able to uh, make use of. Um, but it, everybody is working on the same sort of thing in that regard at the moment and it, it does take a bit of time uh, to, to work those things out. But um, we, will, we will keep everybody updated particularly our candidates and stakeholders as to any new options that come come our way. Um, a question from Monica, should candidates have a previous level of C1 for best results from the prep courses? So we recommend uh, for candidates taking part in a preparation course that they probably want a high B2 level rather than a C1 level. C1 is really the level that they need to pass, but it does depend, of course, on the time that they have available to prepare. And we know that a lot of healthcare professionals um, are coming through um, very busy, they don't have a lot of spare time and often they book the test perhaps intending to prepare um, as they go along but because of being so busy they end up perhaps with only a week or two weeks um, to actually do some preparation. So it depends on the candidate scenario but if a candidate has a portion of time that they can dedicate to preparation, a high B2 uh, kind of level would be um, appropriate for a preparation course. Uh, Ekaterina says there are no test venues in Russia yet. Uh, do you consider opening one here? Um, are you interested in the Russian market? Absolutely. Um, OET is interested in global domination. And I did notice as I put that slide up on the screen that uh, Russia was very white in comparison to the blue where we do have our test venue. So absolutely, we would be interested um, about uh, offering the test in Russia. Um, and so p do please uh, reach out via the website um, or contact me after the event. Um, I think my contact details are available um, for you to, to find out some more. <laughs> yes, global domination. Why not? We have high high hopes and big expectations at, at OET. Um, and on that score, we're also obviously at the moment um, communicating with America and Canada about the possibility to see the test recognized there for healthcare professionals wanting to work in those countries. So we are, um, we are a small company, a small test, um, but we have very um, high ideals. Um, I'm not sure whether I still have a bit more time to answer questions or not. Let's see if I can answer these two that have just come up and then um, I think perhaps it's time for me to hand over to the next presenter. So um, what about Armenia? Um, absolutely, we're very interested to hear from any location that would like to offer a test venue. Um, we'll ask you to submit an application form and part of that will be to provide your estimation of what demand there would be for OET in your country. Um, but provided um, that there would be a demand to make it a, a viable business for you offering the test in your location and for us to offer the test there, then we're very happy to, to hear from any applications to do with test venues. 
And Annie is mentioning, can doctors pass the exam in Yerevan? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, is that a location? Um, I, I'm not exactly sure, uh, but do obviously doctors are able to take the test um, and, and provided that their level meets the, the level required by the regulators. Ah, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Capital of Armenia. So no, currently not um, a test venue there. Um, the full list of test venues are available on the OET website. Um, and as I've sort of tried to explain, we, we will look to expand wherever we can um, uh, going forward. Uh, thanks, Joe, for your comment saving me there. Um, I think it's time for me to hand over to you for your presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to stay with you for the rest of the conference. It is nine o'clock here in um, Australia, so it is soon going to be time for me to get ready for bed. But I'm glad to hear that uh, the, the recordings will be available after. And please do get in touch with me um, via email if you have any further questions. It's been my pleasure to join you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Super. Um, thank you very much for that, Rebecca. Um, obviously, um, I've tra traveled more in my job as a business development person. Okay, my name is Joanna Raskin, and I'm the head of Cambridge Exams Publishing. And I'm based in Cambridge. Um, but until recently, I was actually in Singapore, so I did get to go to Australia and meet the OET team quite a lot while I was there. Now, can I do the slide? Yes, okay, so Cambridge Exams Publishing is a joint unit owned by Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment English. And our job in the publishing world is to publish exam practice materials for the Cambridge exams. And that includes IELTS, which, as you know, is, is written by Cambridge and distributed by the British Council and IDP. Also, all the other exams that Cambridge Assessment English produces, including the Young Learners, Key Preliminary, all the way up to Proficiency. Um, we also publish um, books for some of the exams of our, our sister companies, including OET. And what I want to talk to you today is about a new book we've just released about a month ago, um, which is the OET Nursing. So it's a Cambridge guide to OET nursing. And I've just included the ISBN there, um, just in case any of you want to order it. Um, it's available um, via our usual distributors in Cambridge University Press. And if you have any questions around how to get hold of it, I know that my colleagues in Cambridge Assessment English will be able to point you in the right direction. As I said, this book is only about six weeks old and we've called it the Cambridge Guide to OET and it's a very similar book to the Cambridge official Cambridge Guide to IELTS, if any of you know that book. So just want to spend a few moments going through what's inside the book. Okay, so this book is a nice thick book. I oh, like that, that big. I should have a copy, but I'm at home and I didn't remember to take it from the office with me. Um, so we have an introduction to OET, so to the test, what's in it, and this book is focused for nurses. At the moment we haven't produced one for doctors, it's something we're looking at, but this one is just for the nurses preparing for OET. Now I'm sure that you've heard in the earlier presentation from Rebecca that the re, some of the sections are the same for nurses and doctors and the, some of the productive skills particularly are slightly different. So it wouldn't be useless for doctors, but it's definitely geared towards nurses. So it goes through the test, the format, how it works. It looks at each of the skills, so the reading, listening, writing, and speaking. It also has two full OET practice tests, um, which allow students to practice um, in a, you know, with timings in a real life situation. We've put all the audio, all the audio transcripts and all the answers online. So you can buy the book physically and then you can go online, um, something called eSource, and you can get download everything you need to, um, to have a complete set and to, do, to use the listening. 
Um, the teachers' resources um, are also online in the same place as the um, audio and the transcripts and the answers. So as I said, this book is suitable for nurses who need to pass an OET exam. It's suitable for classroom and self-study. We, when developing it, we started by developing this book in India, which is obviously where a lot of nurses are coming from. Um, and it's written by um, people who teach OET in Australia and in the UK. So they're very much, they were thinking about the target, the nurses who need to pass the OET. Um, it's a, it's, but they can use it in a classroom of a teacher and we've, we've tested it with teachers and they've used it in classrooms. But it's also as a guide, it's also quite useful for self-study. And because the answers and all the tape scripts are all available online, um, you're not dependent on the teacher to get that information. The book has been written at a C1 level of English. Now I heard Rebecca earlier saying that particularly for classrooms, we recommend that students are high B2. And I think that's the entry point. If, you, if you're B2, you would be able to use this book. Um, but it's not a language book. It's very much a test familiarization book. And one thing we are looking at, I see the questions just come up from Barbara about whether there's a B2. <laughs> yeah, I answered it. And um, we are looking as well about whether we want to develop a book that's um, an English course um, at lower levels at B1 and B2. But I think this would work perfectly well at a B2 level at the moment. And I think that's about it. Um, if there's any more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, there are other materials um, that OET publish around practice tests, um, and we hope to have more materials in the future. But do let me know if you've got any feedback on the book, that would be great. Thank you. Um, is it suitable for underground, undergraduate nurses? Absolutely. Um, it's very much a book that focuses on the content of the test. So if somebody, need, and as you know, the test is testing what nurses come across in their day-to-day -day life. So I think it would be a very useful book um, for anybody who's studying English and nursing. Okay, so if there aren't any more questions, I will leave you to the rest of your session. Any, any questions that come to you later, please feel free to talk to my colleagues at Cambridge Assessment English and I will get them answered for you. But in the meantime, I hope the conference goes very well and it was very nice to be able to join you all. Thank you very much. Hello, dear colleagues. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, am I on air? I hope so. Yes, hello. Uh, I would like first to thank all the people speakers I think we have learned so uh, much new information today uh, and I'm go I am the first uh, participant on the Russian side uh, I am presenting Northwestern State Medical University uh, and I we are go me and my colleagues are going to speak about the need in OE uh, in Russia we are also going to tell upon the questions of current testing systems that we have and the ones that are helping us to go through these difficult coronavirus times when we are all sitting at home getting ready for our classes. So uh, as you have seen in Rebecca's presentation, the vast 
a big territory of our world is not covered, which is uh, occupied by Russia, we have no venues for OET. But as my presentation is going to prove, we have real needs for this. And now I'm going to tell you why. I hope that you will, um, uh, you will be interested in learning how the things are in Russia what we are doing here uh, and um, ask me questions later if you have some. So first of all, um, I would like to give you some facts about my university. It is located in St. Petersburg, Russia. It was founded in 2011, uh, but it's much older because this date is the date of merging of two uh, largest universities, medical universities in St. Petersburg. Um, now it is one of the largest in Russia and the largest in northwestern part of the country. We have a lot of students, 2,500 uh, 2, students and 300 of them are foreign students. Uh, and all the other numbers you can see in the slide. Uh, so, some pictures of uh, our university, as you can see, it is a beautiful old building, a lot of blocks, and our beautiful city, and we all welcome you to St. Petersburg, taking the chance. Uh, so, uh, now let me speak about times of English language proficiency testing that are taking uh, place at our university. So we have two types of testing. The first one is testing for inner purposes, uh, which is for current academic performance. So our students have to take tests and examinations at the end of the course, and this is what we are doing for them, of course. But my colleagues are going to give you more detail about that. I'm not going to uh, speak about it right now. What I am going to focus on is test and assessment for students and teachers' participation in international activities. And here is why. We have, uh, um, so the need for getting medical media into inter on international level, into the globalization world, is um, coming from two sides. First of all, from government regulations and the government requirements that are given to us. Uh, and secondly, from um, the actual impetus of students and teachers to participate in world Mm, event. So, first of all, we have two um, state regulations documents. You can see them here the new federal educational standards, which refocused medical education from solely inside the international market. And this was very new to us because before that, uh, and it traditionally comes from the Soviet times, doctors were educated and were uh, brought up to be doctors for only inside market. Uh, after 2014, they were supposed to become international and with the English language, of course. Uh, the second project that is um, that we have to follow as well as national priority project education for experts. This is a, a quite an unusual name. Everybody agrees upon that. Uh, it means that uh, the number of non-citizens getting uh, Russian um, diplomas in higher education and in medical too has to rise. Uh, and we have very daring ideas, our government has very daring ideas on that. We have to raise the level significantly. So again, this we need not only to get international students but also to send our students to uh, other countries and for this of course they need to prove their level of English uh, using testing systems. So um, we, ha we have two um, groups of needs for a unified language assessment system that we don't have at the moment. Uh, the first one is tests for teachers. Uh, According to this international, um, sorry, according to this uh, expert of education program, we are supposed to teach international students here. And for this, teachers need to have high proficiency in the language and they need to prove somehow that they can do that, that they can actually teach. So, uh, as we have no standardized for this, we are performing our own course and give our own certificate at the end of this course. This is what we are doing right now. This year is the first. Uh, me and my colleagues that are going to speak later are teaching our 
colleagues at university, our teachers, uh, and at the end they will get their certificate. But this is only our first try. We hope it will be successful, but once again, as there is no standardized system, we are here quite on our own. Uh, the second part is test for the students. We use adapted, uh, really adapted parts of OET test for students uh, that would like to take and uh, participate in academic mobility assess the performance in the English language uh, but as there is no once again standardized system both um, these tests are local uh, though the number of students willing to participate is quite high um, we had this year I have some numbers this year we had about 80 students um, which is higher than last year but still not as much as we would like to have uh, and if we could offer them to take part in the standardized test this would be much easier for them uh, so unlike the previous uh, speakers we were supposed to give quite short talks just to get you acquainted with what the situation is like in russia so i am already getting to my conclusions so we think my me and my colleagues we think that now there are really strong needs for OET examination and assessment in Russia and they are explained by first of all global interna internationalization processes in medical and academic uh, medical media we are already changing the courses for postgraduate students to turn them not to just learn in English but to um, get international to go international um, the more specific examples will be provided by my colleagues about how we are doing this uh, the second thing is lack of unified English language testing system for students and doctors wishing to participate in academic mobility or going and working abroad uh, so this this is a really serious Problem. Once again, you have seen the map where the Russia, Russia is uh, blank, no venues for international testing for medical professionals here. And the last one is that uh, OET could be a response to latest government regulations in the area, so we could, uh, on our side, improve um, the preparation of our students, and this will be an asset, of course. Uh, well, thank you. Hello, I hope everyone uh, hears me well. I'm, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm the head of foreign languages department at our medical university that Anna, the previous presenter, has already represented to all our dear audience. I'm really happy to greet you in these difficult and unprecedented times. And uh, what is the purpose of my presentation today? The first, I would add several ideas to the previous presenter, my colleague Anna, uh, regarding the needs uh, in OET in the Russian Federation. Uh, I guess that I would suggest our colleagues from OET in Australia and also in uh, Great Britain uh, to carry out a very precise and mapped uh, needs analysis and SWOT analysis of opportunities and possibilities of adaptation of OET uh, to Russian medical schools and also to assessment uh, systems uh, for future medical people uh, because uh, just uh, our medical universities belong to the government and they are the part of our federal budget. The federal budget imposes a lot of its own rules and principles to the learning outcomes of uh, medical high schools. That is why we should be very, very attentive and very careful about integrating and adapting all 
OET or Cambridge assessment uh, tools and systems to our own teaching and learning uh, practices and assessment systems. Uh, in this case, to exemplify the need in OET or in Cambridge assessment system, I would emphasize on such a category at Russian uh, medical universities as academic mobility and students who participate in this academic mobility. They really need in something uh, that is adaptive as Cambridge assessment system and OET exam. By now we have already adapted the oral part in the system of testing uh, of uh, the students who are going to go abroad to participate in clinical attachments in English-speaking countries. And uh, uh, we adapted only the first, uh, sorry, only the oral part of OET exam because the rest of skills in writing, reading and uh, uh, listening, we check during all our teaching process on the first year uh, of the education. And now I will move on to the uh, content of my presentation. Uh, sorry, yes. Mm. Uh, if we have a look at uh, uh, this chart, we try to find an answer what the assessment system is and how we should construct it. Uh, the first very important thing for constructing and design of the appropriate assessment system is to identify the learning outcomes of uh, teaching and learning process. Having identified the learning outcomes, we can identify methods and tools that we use in our teaching and learning practices. And only after that, we construct, design, choose or adapt appropriate assessment tools to understand if we reached the uh, planned learning outcome during our teaching process. And that is, why we cons uh, that is how we construct our assessment system. What is happening now with all our pedagogical efforts uh, that uh, we were doing during long, long times? So I'm uh, with Medical University and in the, pro uh, in the teaching and learning process of English language at Medical University for already seven years. And um, during these seven years, we tried to modernize, to renew and to update teaching and learning practices and also uh, planned uh, learning outcomes and to be, to come, uh, uh, to keep up with the pace uh, and to keep up with the rest of the world. And so what are the learning outcomes at our university? Uh, that we were trying to reach over these seven years before uh, current situation. Of course, we tested our students after the course of English language on use of language and uh, the planned level of uh, language was B1, B2. Also, we tested on understanding, interpreting a scientific test or a paragraph. That is very important for all medical high schools in Russia uh, because, as far as I mentioned before, uh, the competencies that uh, we're trying to reach during the educational uh, process are imposed by the government and one of the competencies that is very important and actual for the Russian medical schools is uh, the ability uh, to carry out uh, scientific uh, activity uh, and participate uh, in global academic community and global scientific community in English language. And the next, what we test, which skills or which learning outcomes we test at our students is oral communication and general situations in medicine. And again, we are focused here on BA, uh, sorry, B1, B2 levels. On the whole, that is our system of measurement of English language proficiency. Apart from the students who are going to 
uh, take part in academic mobility and join clinical attachments uh, in uh, European clinics. Uh, we uh, used to, uh, and I'm emphasizing here, we used to test our students online only in 30% because the rest of our examination and of our testing system was carried out face to face. What we are facing now at our university. Once uh, different uh, epidemiological measurements were imposed onto all over Russia and all over um, a lot of European countries as well, uh, just we faced a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty in everything uh, that we are in. It is the system of education, it is, uh, it is our psychological condition, of course, how we perceive, how we understand everything that is going on around us now. And what is more important currently is that it is uncertainty and confusion in all the le uh, tools and pedagogical methods and approaches that we are applying in our teaching practice. Uh, from the uh, 6th of March, the majority of our university have gone online and uh, all our face-to-face -face classes were embedded into the uh, distant and remote uh, forms of teaching practices. And now we have to start thinking about how we will assess uh, the planned learning outcomes uh, in the end of the term. So the most uh, important challenge nowadays that we are going to tackle with all the staff, teaching staff of the Department of Foreign Languages at the North Western State Medical University in St. Petersburg, is how to develop and design and implement into the educational process an objective and appropriate and adequate assessment system. Uh, before uh, imposing epidemiological measures for fighting COVID-19, how was our teaching and learning process uh, at the university organized? The most important uh, attention, of course, was devoted to face-to-face -face classes in the classroom. And there we used uh, uh, the teaching resource, teaching and learning resource, by Oxford University Press, uh, sorry, by uh, Oxford, Oxford uh, by Oxford University Press, <clears throat> Nursing One. Uh, also, we developed uh, a number of teaching and learning materials to adapt this resource to our purposes and uh, in the needs of the Russian Federations for future medical people. And uh, the LFM Moodle, uh, the resource of the LFM Moodle that we developed there, was used to organize a self-directed study for students. What happens now at our university and with uh, our teaching and learning process in foreign languages. LFM Moodle and all channels of video communication that are available more or less now, it is Skype and Zoom, uh, have occupied the privileged position now in our teaching and learning practices. And everything that we use as a principal tool for educating and for training uh, has uh, made a step behind and uh, we use it as only additional material. Consequently, uh, we have to change somehow the assessment system of uh, the process that we are doing now and of the planned learning outcome. If before COVID-19 we had, uh, ah, here I would like to exemplify our assessment system that we 
are embedded into the educational process for postgraduate students. Why I have decided to focus our attention on postgraduate students because it is very illustrative if, when we see what, uh, how sometimes the needs in the foreign language acquisition at Russian Medical School uh, do not correlate with the needs at European, European medical schools. So before COVID, for postgraduates to, to assess their learning outcomes, we offered the following structure of the exam. Uh, it included uh, the um, uh, creation of examination portfolio but by each postgraduate that is going through the course at our university. After that, uh, we organized the oral part of the exam where they, we checked their ability to render a paragraph or a scientific test. Also, uh, this part included a written translation and discussion of written translation face to face with the examiner. And also we carried out a face-to-face -face interview. Once we, we faced with the necessity of uh, uh, delivering our classes through online tools, we have to change somehow our assessment system even for postgraduate students. So we decided to keep examination portfolio uh, in the exam, but we decided uh, not to score it only, but also to give a mark from two to five. Next, uh, such a part as rendering in the written form was also kept in the structure of the exam. We also decided to keep uh, such a task as written translation from English to Russian, and uh, we, uh, we are prone to uh, carry out a face-to-face -face interview through online tools such as Zoom and Skype. But what is challenging us now? It is how to be objective in this assessment for both sides, the examiner and a student, how to make this assessment process time-consuming uh, for, firstly, for the teacher, and how to make it efficient and also reasonable. Uh, reasonability is a very good criterion uh, for the any assessment system because, because now in uh, these difficult times we have to uh, uh, to support our teaching staff and our our students uh, and uh, that uh, we do not give up <laughs> yes like this on this this slide I have represented the checklist uh, for assessment of postgraduate examination portfolio what it is a postgraduate examination portfolio it includes um, several articles uh, for translation uh, the uh, overall amount of translated symbols should be about 25,000. Also, it includes several scientific articles on uh, rendering during the oral part of the exam. Why we introduced this uh, task into the exam for postgraduates? The reason is that uh, one of the competencies that is imposed by the government onto the medical high schools to be formed uh, during the educational process is the ability to carry out scientific activities uh, in written and oral communication. With this task, we are trying to check the formation uh, of such a learning outcome as ability to understand and translate and adapt an English scientific test uh, to uh, the Russian understanding. Uh, here I would draw your attention on the criteria that we offer to fulfill the um, to fulfill for our post graduates. I have to emphasize here that these criteria were uh, adapted a lot 
after the uh, COVID-19 changed our uh, life and our habits and our modes of work, we, uh, we uh, give an account to ourselves that uh, our postgraduates are the medical people and now they are working online uh, sorry, they are working in line and they are working on the front line of any hospital. And we are just giving a chance to our students to gather uh, more scores for uh, their efforts to uh, accomplish the course of foreign languages, of English language at the university. That is why we decided to assess this technical characteristics of uh, portfolio and included such a criterion as technical characteristics of the front page and technical characteristics of references. Uh, at the same time, we are checking uh, the quality of the translation that uh, the postgraduates performed during um, preparing this uh, examination portfolio. And here on the slide, you can see these criteria enlisted to assess the adequacy and accuracy of uh, uh, this translation. Also, we developed a number of uh, checklists uh, to assess uh, oral activity uh, and uh, oral speech of our uh, students, but uh, uh, now being in the process to finalize these criteria and these checklists, we are facing the following challenges such as uh, once we have uh, um, chosen or we have uh, started a new mode of training, of educating and of teaching foreign language, uh, we have to design and develop a new system of assessment and we have to try to be adequate in the assessment of those learning outcomes that we have planned before, before the world of the higher education has changed so much. So I hope that um, my message uh, is clear enough and if you have any questions please ask me Okay, so as I see, I can start. Uh, hello, my name is Ekaterina, uh, and uh, I'm also from Northwestern State Medical University. And today in my talk, I would like to share our experience of teaching and learning medical English online. Uh, and uh, my talk will be also a thank you speech for all our teaching staff in our department who uh, did a great job for implementing all these things into practice. Okay, so traditionally uh, in Russia, in medical universities, a medical English course uh, included and still in some universities includes uh, materials on teaching uh, physiology, microbiology, and uh, anatomy in English. So just only text and practically no speaking in medical English. And in 2014, uh, in our department, we started a quiet revolution and we got rid of all these things and we decided to implement uh, as something new, something uh, really new, and we I uh, came to the idea of introducing a new uh, textbook into our university. Okay. Uh, that was medical um, English, that is nursing one. So Natalie has already mentioned about that. Uh, so why did we choose this textbook exactly for our first uh, for our students? Uh, the reason is that we are teaching general medicine students and we teach English only for first year students. And as you understand, they are just former school children who do not know much about uh, medicine in general, just only some general information about uh, medicine. So they are just the newcomers in, into medicine. Uh, 
the good thing about this textbook is that it has got the teachers at least and uh, audio CDs, but uh, the disadvantage is that it uh, doesn't have any workbook for, for students to practice grammar and uh, vocabulary and speaking and writing and listening skills. So that's why uh, we uh, made a decision to uh, design uh, a series of workbooks which will accompany uh, this textbook. So as you can see on this slide, we've got three uh, uh, workbooks uh, which uh, match uh, every five units in this textbook. Uh, but uh, of course we needed to do something to organize students' uh, self-study and independent work. So that's why uh, just um, following, the re following the recommendations of our university, we also started uh, designing uh, online modules in Moodle, uh, the platform which was accepted in our university. So uh, today, by March to, uh, to 2020, uh, as we can see now, our life has changed into two parts before COVID 2019 and after. Uh, just before March 2020, uh, we had the following. Uh, we have designed a series of uh, e-learning modules for the general medicine uh, course for the students of, of who study general medicine. Uh, and, uh, uh, they include uh, they included speech techniques for successful doctor to patient communication, uh, video tasks for medical students, medical correspondence for specialists in general medicine, and essential grammar for medical students. So. Now, uh, we obliged them to do the tasks online because that was additional practice for them. Uh, as we all uh, are quite limited with the number of contact hours, that was additional practice and training for our students. But a lot has changed in March 2020. Yeah? Uh, now we are all struggling against COVID 2019, and uh, as uh, it is a well known fact, a war uh, drives technological advancement, yeah? And uh, just this situation uh, made us think of new ways of um, uh, delivering um, medical English uh, teaching. So we transformed uh, our uh, process of teaching uh, online completely. So instead of contact hours, we introduced them uh, online um, with the help of Zoom. Uh, and while teaching online, we just work with nursing run textbook. And uh, all the uh, self-study and independent work of students was transformed into Moodle. So just as you can see here, we call it online medical English course. It's practically a complete course, which uh, was designed according to the uh, rules of designing any online course, like on Coursera or FutureLearn and so on. Um, some of the students, uh, our students, they can choose uh, working just online using the Moodle course. And the problem is that Russia is quite bad. So students were allowed during this difficult time to go back to their regions. Just exactly in our university, particularly in our university, 70% of students are from the region, so they are not from Petersburg. Uh, and you also, um, we also have to to care uh, to keep in mind the fact that we have a quite a great number of students who come from the Crimea, so the new uh, Russian region, and they really have problems with the connection, and uh, more than that, they have uh, a problem to the, with the access to the uh, number of uh, websites, and Zoom is not allowed there, so that's why in this case, we just uh, offer them to have, uh, to, to take an online medical English course, which was designed in our university, and uh, just uh, we, uh, to, we practice them with uh, uh, the help of Skype or WhatsApp, it's up to, to the teacher to decide which channel uh, to use. Yeah. And so talking about the online medical English course, it also has a, uh, a particular structure. Uh, just it was okay. Uh -huh. um, 
it was uh, designed according to the textbook yeah it matches the, the lessons uh, in uh, the um, in the course uh, correspond to the units of the textbook uh, here there is um, a structure of um, of the topic of the unit uh, as you can see, it's quite, uh, it offers a big range of activities, but uh, you should uh, care, uh, keep in mind that uh, um, we study uh, a unit uh, during two or three lessons. So this number of activities is quite enough for students to practice um, the vocabulary of the unit or grammar or just reading or listening or writing skills. More than that, we uh, transformed uh, the activities from the uh, designed workbooks uh, into online um, format. So that's uh, what we have now. And uh, just uh, as I said, that uh, the, uh, the war times uh, are quite good for making technological advancement. Uh, the thing which we just did uh, is that we uh, designed and realized uh, a number of video presentations, just a, a slide from one of them you can see here, uh, where the students um, are introduced with the material of the unit, and then they just uh, do a number of offered exercises. So that's uh, about our experience. Uh, I hope that you really found something useful and you will uh, try, you will use this information to work for teaching in your university just during this difficult time. Okay, so have you got any questions here? Okay, I hope that everything was clear enough so that you do not have any questions. Um, Thank you, Katerina. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we hope that this conference was, was um, useful and uh, you enjoyed your time with us. So we are going to share the materials without one week. We will send the record. of the webinar and the presentations.